Family and fellow soldiers, I'm the professor, and this is the moment of truth. What had prompted this morning's briefing happened to be that I saw, not in any videos on my channel, but I had seen on a couple of other channels that have to do with politics, yes, I'm talking about MSNBC and others, that there were some black folks who apparently were getting into the idea of respectability politics. And that seems to be a perennial trap that a lot of black folks just love getting snared by. The best way to ensure that you win an argument is to put your opponent on the defensive and keep him there. That means you don't talk about the subject at hand at all. You talk about your opponent. That way, he never gets a chance to put forward any sort of argument of his own in the first place. The best way to put your opponent on the defensive is direct accusations against him. That's where we get the term ad hominem. It means to the man. That's an ad hominem attack. Especially if you're making false attacks. You launch those at your opponent and he'll be so busy fending those off, he'll have less time to develop any sort of argument against you. The racial political equivalent of this would be how the white media demonizes black people. That's the purpose of the white media serves. No story is apparently too far out there or too unrelated to the black community for them to be able to shoehorn us into the conversation at some point. Now, their personal favorite attack against us is that whenever there's some black person who they're accusing of something, which is all the time, by the way, the discussion is never about root causes or how to change things. You know, the way that it is with the white community. The meth epidemic is bigger than the crack epidemic ever was, bigger than the heroin epidemic ever was. But the white media is not talking about incarceration. The white media is not talking about the failure in all of these suburban and homes and others. Instead, it's basically putting out the sad violin and, oh, let's feel sorry for these people. It's talking about root causes and how we need to change things. Talking about the black community, on the other hand, it's all about punishment, all about incarceration, and what's wrong with these people. A nonstop string of accusations and condemnations from the white media against the black community. Starting with things like, don't you condemn Minister Farrakhan? Do you condemn him? Oh, they always make sure they do that. Can you name the white person who the white media makes it a litmus test for white people to condemn? Another one is, well, this white supremacist over here just got through killing some black folks. Do you forgive him? Black people, not all, but certainly a large number of us, keep falling into the trap that the white media's accusations are somehow based in some sort of apprehension of us. That if we can just prove to these white supremacist racists with cameras and microphones that we're not so bad and that their accusations are false, that somehow we're going to change their minds about us. We keep failing to see that the white media's accusations are not a means to an end at all. Their accusations are an end unto themselves. The white media gets what it wants when they demonize and attack us. That's the point. They could care less what our response is. Hell, they could edit it out and it would mean the exact same thing. We're the ones who keep thinking that this is some sort of argument taking place when in reality it's just a white supremacist monologue. Which is where the lie about black radicals comes from. By the way, no such creature exists. Certainly not in the United States. Where are the black people who are taking hostages and blowing up buildings with hundreds of people inside? In other words, where are the typical things that white supremacist extremists have always done? From Germany to Ireland to Timothy McVeigh to the January 6th insurrection? See, what the white supremacists understand is what Malcolm told you. White supremacists, they know what a revolution is. And they also know that black people have never been talking about a revolution, not a real one. At best, we may have made some minor disturbing noises about it here and there, but there was not and still is not a solid commitment to a revolution, not like what you see from these white supremacists. White society is not facing an existential threat at all. They never have, certainly not from black people. However, white dominance is facing a threat. And from false news, uh, I mean Fox News, to both political parties, you see this fixation on making sure that anyone talking the wrong way gets attacked. This is why you see the white left and the white right on the same page about so-called wokeness. You would think that right now, with them being so, quote-unquote, polarized, that they wouldn't be able to agree on anything. They can't even agree on what day of the week it is. And yet they both are in lockstep, joined at the hip when it comes to attacking wokeness, and wokeness as a euphemism for black. Because whenever they talk about what constitutes wokeness, it's always, always the things that black people say. That's how they make wokeness into a euphemism for black without saying the word black. It's one of white supremacy's favorite tricks, context clues. There's only two acceptable types of Negroes under white supremacy. 
the shameless lying bootlick on the Negro left who falsely claims that America has come a long way, as John Lewis put it, when the truth is America has not moved one iota since the Civil War, and the utterly disgusting liars on the Negro right who claim that racism was solved a long time ago, Clarence Thomas and Candace Owens and other idiots fall into that category, both of them are spouting the exact same lie. They're only stating them differently. The only real rhetorical difference, at least, is that one of them talks about the ending of racism in the past tense, and the other one talks about the ending of racism in the future tense, but neither one of them is saying anything serious about crushing anti-black racism in the present tense. None of them makes it a point to attack the white media's demonization of the black community. But then again, why should they? They themselves are operatives of white supremacy. Why would they attack Massa? Let me give you a case study. You probably remember the story of Patty Hearst. She was this white woman who was the granddaughter to the great Philip Randolph Hearst, the white media mogul. And what had happened was she had been allegedly kidnapped by a gang of big black niggas called the Symbionese Liberation Army. Now, of course, the white media was going into a frenzy about this. Oh, God, those Negroes ran off with her. It's just like King Kong, and you know how those niggers are. They're going to kill her and eat her and, or whatever. Well, they were very shocked when they saw that Patty Hearst made a reappearance. She was helping the Symbionese Liberation Army to rob banks so that they could get funding for whatever. But the truth of the matter is, here she is with a machine gun, and it's pretty obvious that uh, if she's a hostage, she ain't looking like a very unwilling one. Now, the outrage from white America was not over Patty Hearst robbing banks. For God's sake, her family were some of the biggest crooks in American business. The problem, the outrage, was that she was a white woman who was subordinating herself to a group led by a black man. That's what the outrage was about, especially by the white media. Many, if not most, in white society saw that image. They saw all of this going on, and they immediately began wondering how many times she had sex with those black men. The demonization of the Symbionese Liberation Army was completely and thoroughly predictable. After Patty Hearst was rescued, actually just arrested, what she did was she immediately began denouncing them because she knew that was expected of her. Patty Hearst was convicted of bank robbery, but everybody understood that wasn't her real crime. Her real crime was that she was a blonde-haired, blue-eyed white woman who was seen here as being submissive to a gang of black men, especially black men who were inflicting their will on white power, especially white financial institutions. That was her real crime. The white media also was laying the groundwork for her eventual redemption. She isn't black, so it's all right to go ahead and rehabilitate her image. Stockholm Syndrome, Stockholm Syndrome, screaming it as loudly as they could. See, whenever a white person commits a crime or does some sort of action that's against the law or what have you, the white media always makes sure to put in the narrative, mental disorder. It was a mental... This is certainly not them acting normally. It's a mental disorder. On the other hand, with black people, well, that's just the way those people are. Nothing's wrong with them. That's just the way those people are. Patty Hearst did a little bit of time. All the while, she was denouncing the Symbionese Liberation Army. She made it very clear. Oh, those, those big black niggers, they just had me intimidated. It was, it was all them. It was not me. I had no choice. And that was understood to be what she actually had to do to get herself out. In short order, you had President Carter, who commuted her sentence. Because she was now forgiven, okay, you go, we went ahead and demonized those niggers. You went ahead and told, them, told everybody that those guys were no good. You know, that's what we expected you to do, so we'll go ahead and commute your sentence now. And President Clinton would later give her a pardon, so that just lets you know that I guess Bill Clinton was still hoping that maybe he might have had a chance with it. I don't know. But Patty Hearst understood that once you go black, you're not allowed to come back. So she had to go ahead and put the extras on it, and it worked, because that being the case, that's what happens with a whole lot of these folks from the dominant society. They try to act like they're down until things get hot, and then all of a sudden, you know, oh, I, I'm, I want to go back to my suburban enclave, my suburban safe space. Now, what's this got to do with anything under white supremacy? Radical means any dissent or opposition, no matter how benign or non-confrontational, no matter how mildly you put it. Respectability politics is the goal of the defeated, and yet that's how so many black folks choose to behave. The enemy understands that he's lying about us with these accusations, but do you? They call Dr. King, of all people, a radical. You had a preacher who spouted the most harmless and innocuous verses of Jesus Christ talking about the love of God, 
King went out of his way not to be threatening, but the fact that he was demanding changes and had people backing him up on that, that was the threat. White supremacy is a lie, a house of cards, so they have to be ultra-hypersensitive about making sure that there is not one person who will challenge them. That's why the psychopathic obsession with policing every aspect of black life. They have to do it. They don't have a choice. They have to make decency profane. They have to make the reasonable unreasonable. They have to make a better world undesirable. One man's heaven is another man's hell, after all. Except this white supremacist status quo isn't even working for more and more white people. Yet, when it's the only thing you've ever known and it's responsible for what you have, what are you going to do? Power, it's been said, is the ability to define yourself and your relationship to those around you in such a way that your definition becomes theirs. Of course, we have no control over how others attempt to define us. We can resist it, but ultimately we can refuse to accept their definition of us and fight to establish one of our own. That's why you see more and more black people gathering around terms like FBA and others, defining ourselves for ourselves. Does that mean we utterly ignore when the enemy is trying to put labels on us? No. We understand when they use terms against us as being done as a pretext to attack. Monitoring and being aware of the enemy's words is not the same as accepting them. And you're supposed to be aware of what the enemy is doing. We're in a state of war. But the point of this morning's briefing is to reinforce that black folks, you don't ever sit here and fall into this trap, this endless, like a dog chasing its own tail, you waste of time, that we're going to be getting the very people of making accusations against us to change their minds. They're not doing it because they have some sort of honest misapprehension that you can disabuse them of. The demonization is the point. Because as long as they're demonizing you, you're not putting forward your argument. And you better stay focused. You have to. And ignore the sloppy mouth morons who are trying to find a way to get themselves some TV time. Or trying to get the white media to look on them favorably because they're desperately hoping they can get a TV show. I'm not going to be arguing with white supremacists trying to have some sort of pointless, running around in circles, rhetorical game going because I think that I'm going to improve what they say or change what they say. Forget it. And besides, the only Negroes who you see who are losing any sleep over what the white media thinks are the Negroes who are still desperately hoping to get a pat on the head. And I'll tell you right now, even when a dog gets a pat on the head, it's still a dog. Good day, and be one. I'd like to take a moment to mention some of our contributors. Alfonso Mohammed, Doris Rushing, C.J. Link, James Porter, and Jasmine B. Salute to them, and thank you to everyone for listening, liking, and sharing this message. Black empowerment only exists because of you.